This video is about plotting shadows using linear perspective. So if I have a situation like this image, uh, which I've put together a field, just an empty background, and then a tower, and combining the two of those together and giving it a realistic shadow. And this has to do with kind of <clears throat> creating a, an assumption of where the sun is, where my light source is. Uh, this is probably most simply illustrated using the sun because it's a single light source and you can see the horizon in the distance. It's fairly easy to plot. So I'm using this as an example. And we're going to put the tower in the field and then figure out exactly where that shadow would fall. Because obviously if you place anything within a photo frame, uh, you have to respect the given light source and color. <clears throat> so we're going to try that. And starting with the field here, which obviously I've also made some color adjustments uh, to blend the things together. Not going to worry so much about that. Instead, we're just going to talk about essentially how to plot uh, the shadow of an object in a given frame. I chose this picture in particular because the, the light source, the direction of the sun, is really ambiguous. I have the option to put it essentially wherever I want to. And that's really helpful when it comes to bringing in something that has its own light source. This is kind of an overcast day, so this is a good option, but still I have a shadow on this tower that runs along the side. And so I'm, I'm going to try to respect that while at the same time obviously enhancing it to increase that shadow. So I'm going to just fairly simply remove the background from this by using a couple of the selection tools like the magic wand and the, I can re never remember the name, the quick selection. So I'll just add to this selection just by dragging through here. I found this to be pretty agreeable. It doesn't put up much of a fight. I'll delete that out. Hit Command D to deselect. And then I'm going to use just a basic eraser brush to remove some of these additional buildings and get this whittled down to just the tower and a bit of the base. I'm not really going to worry about fixing the base of the tower right now, just, just cutting off enough of the stone. So I'll take that and move it over to my my field tab and this is where the first questions of linear perspective become important. As far as where do I place this? Depending on how big I want it to be in the frame Obviously, if I make it a little smaller and I keep it close to the front here, you can see the scale of this grass, whatever this uh, particular vegetation is. You can see the grass a little bit larger and it makes this look like quite a small tower. But if I move it upwards towards the horizon, it starts to look more natural. Also, I'm going to make it even smaller so I can put it further in the distance. If I put it up on the horizon, obviously that looks completely wrong. So it's somewhere in between. It's up here a little ways, uh, but not so far. Uh, so you have to use a little bit of sound judgment, a little bit of common sense when you're placing an element like this that obviously is in perspective and needs to, one way or another, match the basic eye line, the basic horizon line and perspective of the scene. So, probably about right there. We're just going to go with that. And this is where we have to kind of plot out where that shadow would fall. So I'm wanting the sun to, based on the shadow here, to come from this direction, this upper corner, and just kind of throw a shadow on the field. So I'm going to position a little bit further to the left. And this can't really be done on the image that I have here. I'm going to have to increase the size of the canvas through image and canvas size. And I'm going to go in and just add some width and height so that I have some room to work. That gives me a little bit of space around and I can figure out exactly where the sun would be placed. If I place the sun, you know, actually within the frame, it's going to be so low, almost like a setting sun, it's going to cast a shadow all the way off of the frame by a long ways. So I'm going to place the sun a little bit higher, and I'm going to use a shape to help indicate this with the ellipse. So let's say the sun is here. 
Now, depending on where I place that and then the other key element, the horizon line, I want to make sure to mark out the horizon. And I'm going to give these some, some color as well. There's my horizon, which of course is the eye line of the camera. Uh, that is always at eye level, so you can see this is basically where I'm positioned. And that can also help you in terms of uh, placing something like this tower. You know, how tall would a human being be? If this is indeed eye line for a human being, how tall would they be? We would actually fall right about here. So that, that seems decent. That seems reasonable. It might not be perfect, but it's good enough to get the job done. Now when it comes to plotting the shadow, what we're going to have to do is draw a line straight down from the sun that I created to the horizon line. In linear perspective, the intersections between lines are extremely important. So where these lines intersect here now, that becomes a key point for plotting out the shadow. The next thing that we'll do is from the sun again, uh, we will draw lines that cut diagonally and touch the top corners of this monument, this tower, this building. So I'm going to do that on both sides. And I'm just going to let them kind of trail off the page. In fact, I'm probably going to want to make them even longer than that. So I'll zoom out a little bit. Just let them go all the way off the canvas. That's going to make it easy. What we're going to be looking for is where these lines intersect. So if I then, after doing that, after creating those that go across the top corners, I'll go to that intersection between the vertical line and the horizon. And I'll do the same thing, but from the bottom corners. So bottom corner there, bottom corner there. And then I'm looking essentially for where these lines intersect. Again, in linear perspective, where lines intersect is very important. So what I have basically is intersections right here and right here. To clarify that, I'm going to draw another line that cuts between those. And then I'll use the polygonal lasso tool to trace this out. This shape here that I now have marked out with a selection is my shadow because I'm able to plot knowing that light moves in a straight line. Rays of light always move in a straight line. And by basically figuring out the position of the light source based on the horizon, I'm able to plot accurately where the shadow would fall if the light source was indeed in this position. So what I'll do then is just create a new layer and then use Edit and Fill to fill that with color. So now I have a shadow. Obviously it doesn't look like a real shadow. We're going to get to that. And just to simplify my grid a little bit here, I'm going to merge those layers together, name it Grid, and hide it. So now that I've done that, I can also crop down my image again, which there's quite a few different ways to crop, but I usually use the marquee tool and then just literally crop it from the menu. And now we have to make this look like an actual shadow. So the first thing that I'll do is just drop the opacity some. I have it set to complete black so this doesn't make a huge difference, but if I'm using a color or a gray shadow, uh, I'll use multiply to make sure that it behaves properly. Uh, but I just wanted to see a little bit of this grass texture in there. I don't want it to be a completely solid shadow. And then I'm going to apply a blur to it. Not a significant one, but just using a Gaussian blur. I'll go in and add, you know, say 10 pixels worth of blur to it just to keep those edges fuzzy. In fact, maybe I'll do 12 just for a bit more. Obviously, still doesn't look like an actual shadow. If I zoom in and look at it, you can see that it's still, even after the blur, it's a little too clean. It needs to be less so. So I actually don't have my Wacom with me, so I'm going to do this using a less effective method, being the mouse. But I'm going to apply a mask to the shadow, and then I'm going to use a brush. 
to remove some of this. I'm going to set it to 100% opacity on the brush. And I've downloaded some texture brushes, which these are pretty easy to find from a variety of websites, but I have a couple that are, are go-to for giving something a more organic look. So I'm going to use this to mask out some of the edges here. This is not going to look as good as if I did it with a Wacom, but you know what? It's still going to get the job done. I'll drop the opacity on it a little bit to make it a little bit more natural. But the idea is just to go in and give it a more realistic texture that you would get if a shadow was falling across a surface of grass. And just a texture brush like this goes a long way towards creating that sense of realism, especially when you view it from a distance. Now, it's not going to be completely even. There's going to be some areas that are higher, some areas that are lower. And you're having to hear the monotonous clicking because, again, I don't have the Wacom on my desk. That was an oversight by me. But I'm just going to sit here and do this for a minute so that we can get the, the more realistic look. There's actually a couple places that we'll need to do this on the shadow itself, like you see here, and then also along the base of the tower. This actually looks more realistic if I pull up using the mouse. But you can see that already gives, even with the clunky mouse that I'm using rather than a Wacom tablet, it still gives me a pretty good result. So then I'm also going to do the same thing with the tower itself, apply a mask to it, and then go in, because you can see from where I cut it out with the eraser earlier, that doesn't look remotely like it's sitting in a, uh, sitting among tall grass. So I'm going to use this to, again, add some texture to it. There's not a lot of clean lines in nature, especially not at a distance. So this goes makes a big difference in creating a convincing image, which that's when we're compositing, that's really what we're attempting to do, is to convince people that, based on the physics and things that they already understand, that this is a realistic scene. Okay, so I have the, the shadow there, and again, thinking more about uh, how a shadow would manifest, and what that would actually look like. I can use the mask again, this time with a larger, softer airbrush set to about 10% opacity on the brush, I can actually wash away some of the shadow as it moves away from the tower. Because obviously, as the sun comes down and as it strikes this object, there's reflected light bouncing all around in any scene in nature. So the closer the shadow is to the object, the darker the shadow will be. As it moves out further, it will start to diffuse. It'll still be there but it will start to lighten up. So if I go in and start creating effects like essentially a gradient just by using a soft brush it again adds to the realism of my tower shadow. So something like that, that's that's feeling much much better. Now we're going to to emphasize this light a little bit more. I'm going to create a new layer above the tower and I'm going to clip it to the tower layer. I'm going to name that tower shadow. And for this I'm going to use a just a normal hard brush since this is a geometric surface that I'm working on. And I'm going to apply kind of a, a dark bluish gray shadow to it. And this would also be set to multiply. In fact to make this easier I'm even going to take the polygonal lasso and just kind of mark out some of this. I just did a, a really terrible job of it, so let me try that again. I was clicking too fast, and it perceived it as a double click, which means it closes the selection. And on these rocks, I'm going to create kind of a, a surface, almost as though The light is catching a little bit, but not all. 
I'll give it some overlap down at the bottom. And then since this is clipped, I don't have to worry about getting a clean line along the right side. And just kind of fill that in. Again, it's set to multiply. I'm going to drop the opacity of it quite a bit. And even without cleaning up the edge, that gives me a pretty good result. I would go in with a softer brush and clean up that edge some, especially on the more organic surfaces like the stone at the bottom. But I'm not going to worry about that so much right now. What I probably would do, though, uh, even in this situation, is, again, thinking about reflected light. These shadows will tend to have a core to them, so I'll create just a little bit of organic variance. So again, like a 10% uh, opacity brush, just kind of masking out some of it and giving some rebounding highlight on there. It helps a lot with creating a natural look. So anything that's probably catching more light, I'll go in and, and dump just a little bit more on. I might actually bump up the opacity of that shadow just a hair. And already this is giving me considerably more realism. Again, it gives me a sense of the position of the sun, which is actually quite high in this image. Uh, it's almost like a noonday sun, but we can bump this up even further by creating another blank layer and then using something like the gradient tool and white, as long as I have it set to a radial gradient. It's not quite the position where I put the sun. That's a little bit too small. Let's make it bigger. There we go. Obviously overkill. I'll go in and diminish that, but it helps to just throw in some effect that again helps reinforce the position of the sun. Drop the saturation a little bit of the this background, which has clearly been enhanced a little in Photoshop. So it's something I pulled down from Google Images. That's what happens. So I drop the opacity a little bit, maybe even a little too much. Bring that up some. And then I would probably run through all the normal things that I do to help bind images together, which I probably do this more than I should, but uh, using a solid color for a forced color harmony just an orange solid color set to something like soft light and then the opacity set quite low it just warms up the image helps bring elements together and that's what you see on this finished version where I also did a sharpening effect uh, to really bring out and connect the elements that uh, that grass texture, the the old stone, and then of course some color effects. But again, it's all about creating a realistic image. It's about creating something that's convincing. And if you simply put shadows out there without thinking about the direction, without thinking about where they fall, without thinking about how they affect the surface that they fall on, is it grass, is it pavement, it's going to behave differently. So we have to think about the actual natural world in order to represent it properly when we're putting together these images that don't belong together. Uh, we're creating something new by bringing stuff from different sources and producing something that's never been seen before. That's part of the fun but also part of the challenge because you have to make them work together in terms of physics, in terms of light, and it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect by any means. Nothing that I do ever is, but it has to be convincing. It may not stand up to scientific study, but it needs to stand up to your normal, everyday audience.